a season of live q and events on Curzon Home Cinema. It's a very lovely, lovely thing to be here. My name is Edith Bowman and I'm so thrilled to be here and particularly because I get to talk about film score with an incredible artist, considering I've got my own podcast, Soundtracking, where I talk to film creatives about their relationship with music. And it is always a pleasure to get to enthuse and celebrate female composers as well. Uh, last year, she worked with the fabulous Kitty Green on the phenomenal The Assistant. Uh, today and tonight, I'm in conversation about the soundtrack to Josephine Decker's film, Shirley, with composer Tamar Kali. And if you're watching us live, we are taking your questions via comments on YouTube and Twitter. Our handle is Curzon Cinemas, or you can use the hashtag Shirley and we'll read out as many as we can. So please do get your questions in. <clears throat> Tamar Kali, hello, how are you? Oh no. I'm well, how are you? There we go. Yes, I thought you'd frozen for a second. I was like, yes, thankfully she's there. Um, okay. I'm really great. You're there. Okay. I'm glad you're here. It's the way of the world now. We were just talking about that, weren't we? This digital kind of, this remote world that we have to survive in. Yes. Um, listen, congratulations on your work on Shirley. It's, it's an incredibly... I felt that there was, there was such a beautiful presence of music in this film on, on so many levels. And it almost felt like there was, I don't know, almost kind of five scores in there in a way, because the score requires, has lots of different roles and jobs within the film. And um, would you mind starting by talking a, a little bit about how the project presented itself to you and how you, you ended up working on the film? Okay, well, um, I initially had a phone conversation with Josephine. I'm thinking it was, yes, it was after I, I got a screener of the film. And um, maybe we spoke first and then I saw the film and then we spoke again. And I was really intrigued because I know that a lot for a lot of composers and you know that the temp score is sometimes the kiss of death or the thing that you you really don't want to deal with. But what it did in this case, seeing how the film was tempt made me very curious about her choices. It was the most creatively and interesting tempt, um, tempt that I'd ever experienced. And so in addition to the work itself, it, it made me want to take a stab at it because I thought, well, you know, this temp is, is it's, it's so eclectic and there's such a range of energy and emotion yeah. that, I would really love the opportunity since I have a very eclectic musical background. I feel like if, if that's what she's looking for, then I think I'm the one. And um, <laughs> also um, just how her work hit me. And I was looking at some of her other work too. She has this fever dream quality to her films. Mm. And, you know, there was something about the storyline and how it all came together um, that really just, made me curious and excited about exploring that thin veil between the subconscious and the conscious and you know the, the, the dreaming and waking world it just it was exciting there's some really amazing choices as well and kind of um you know in terms of I, I i'm i come out as a film fan and you know i'm not musically musical background so it comes from an emotional reaction i guess to to how i, I connect with the music but in terms of the instrumentation and the power that those different choices make so whether that's the the kind of almost folk nature you know of that uh, of the mushroom scene or the the kind of the choral voices that come in at other points as well. Would you mind talking a little bit about those choices and what those particular choices meant in terms of the connection that your music had with either the characters or the narrative and, and what they, how they elevated or helped drive the story or the character? Well, Josephine um, told me early on that she was interested in the female voice as a lead instrument. And I thought that that would be great, you know, a small indie film, I'm a vocalist. I was like, great, I could really lean on my choral classical path for this mm -hmm. one, um, create something intimate, but expansive in terms of the psychological underpinnings of the film and like where the voice can take the mind in addition to 
you know, uh, string instrumentation and piano. So I, I, wa I wanted to set about creating a palette that was, even though intimate, had the range to convey the range of emotions that we go through in the film. And um, <clears throat> one thing that was so great was that Josephine's instinct, she's fearless. So whereas I tend to temper my ideas for a director, because I don't want to overwhelm them or have them react very strongly to something. Yeah. You know, she kept, she kept requesting more mm -hmm. and she wanted me to swing for the fences. So I was able to, to experiment in this way that I had yet to do in, in, in you know, composing for film. Yeah. So um, in terms of the, the vocals, I said about, instead of having like a particular, like a leitmotif, a theme, I had a voice for the characters, yeah. a, a, a tone, range. So um, Shirley was an alto, Rose was a mezzo, and the missing girl, Paula, was a um, soprano. And I created this sound and this chord based on um, Le Mystère, Le Voix du Bougat, and um, you know, I just wanted to convey this the idea of that, like I said, the veil between the conscious and the subconscious, that we were existing yeah. in this space that was not awake or asleep, that we were on the precipice of something at all times. And then I guess if if you're if you're coming into to the film, and I don't know in terms of, of what was locked by the time that you saw cut, but you know, there's there's um you know, existing music needle drops within the film as well in terms of and they kind of help they tell us so much about the characters, I think, in terms of the choices of the music they listen to or what's playing in, you know, a living room or whatever sort of thing. And was there a conversation around the navigating that, you know, in terms of it, of it, of it having a, a fluidity, I guess? Well, the diegetic music is, is apart from the score, mm. which is great because I think sometimes there's when when <laughs> When the choice around music is too literal in terms of the score needing to reflect the time or the location, yeah, I think that you but you basically create a cage, yeah, for what it can do. And my instinct as a composer when I'm working with film, it's emotional, it's psychological, it's spiritual, it's not genre specific, time specific, or geographical. So um, I love that you know, we, we met in the same place and we're on the same page in that regard. So the diegetic music is what lets you know what era we're in, you know, what it is that um, Stanley does for a living and being an ethnomusicologist, you know, things of that nature. Whereas the score can just really get under your skin and in your being, as opposed to pointing you to the time that the film exists in or yeah. you know, things like that. It's almost like its own narrative running, isn't it, a way? Because it can tell you things that dialogue can't about the characters or about the situation in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think, yeah. Um, I, I've, I've, I've loved, you know, watching and listening to, to your journey as a composer, you know, both with your work with Dee and, and I was lucky enough to speak to Kitty earlier, well, last year, I keep forgetting we're in 2021 already, um, about The Assistant. And um, <laughs> would you might. Would you? I mean, that was an extraordinary film. Um, would you, Would you mind talking a little bit about about your journey into into composing for film and and how you you landed at, at that place in in your in your life, considering your you know your your background with music and and how musical you are as a person and why that that was a choice. You know, it was. It wasn't a choice. It, it was an opportunity that presented itself through the choices I had made up to that point in terms yeah. of being a creative person in the world. Um, so my work as an independent solo artist brought me to a space where I was able to collaborate with Dee on her first, well, to be, yeah, I mean, I guess collaborate. I mean, not in that true literal physical sense, but essentially her DP had put her on to my music 
And it resulted in not only me lending songs to the soundtrack of her first feature film, Pariah, but also doing a cameo and performing with my bands in the film. And then that created this opportunity to develop a relationship with Dee for her to become more familiar with my work. And at the time I, you know, was performing in three different iterations of my work as a, as a composer and performer, a chamber ensemble, a straight ahead rock band and a kind of piano based singer songwriter project. And as she became familiar with my work, it occurred to her that I was capable to score a film for her. And so, you know, she started speaking to me in this way. Um, initially, she wanted me to do the score for Bessie. Um, I had done this special historical performance um, with vintage blues and juke joint classics. And she, you know, was moved and wanted me to work on that project because she understood as, you know, in terms of the footsteps that I'm walking, like I'm standing on the shoulders of Bessie, folks of that ilk. Um, that didn't work out. But what that scenario did in her experience and attempting to get me to work with her in that capacity, it made her it made her resolve stronger to make sure that it happened. And when Mudbound came along, she made sure that she was in a position to make that decision, which is which yeah. is really rad, right? Amazing. Outside of being creative, being someone who has the full vision to make it happen and to and to follow through on that and really fight for the people that you want to work with. Mm -hmm. So she opened the door for me in that way. And um, I'm such a believer in her as a human being, her authenticity um, and her vision as an artist. I was like, hey, <laughs> I can compose, I can compose to your film. You know what I mean? It's like, we had this simpatico, we had this rapport. Um, and then when I saw the work, I was like, hell yeah. It was just a matter of developing the technical skill to do it. Like, I, you know, being able to compose and to write music is one thing, but then yeah. especially in a small indie budget, you know, because it went to Sundance as an independently funded project. And then like a week later it was picked up by Netflix. So this, this was an independent venture, like straight up. So, you know, having the background that I had as an independent artist for 20 plus years, punk rock hardcore, I know how to use a toothpick and chewing gum and some dental floss to make something happen. And <laughs> that's ultimately what I had. And, and four and a half weeks to figure it all out. But, um, oh. you know, I was able to lean on that background to make it. That's incredible. Um, I was lucky enough to have um, the phenomenal Mary G. Blige on, on, on my podcast and she talked so amazingly about you um and and the music on that film and how she felt when she you know sat and watched it for the first time as well it's it was birthday today. no it's birthday today so happy birthday mary yes it is happy birthday mary <laughs> you flies you fabulous capricorn i love that and <laughs> that's awesome and we've had a, got a great question in from simone from london she says i love the soundtrack to shirley also the assistant in mudbound we've just been talking about i was googling and found an interview where you talk about your background in hardcore punk and i wonder um punk feeds into your soundtrack world if not musically maybe the politics of punk influence your soundtrack work and how you work So as I was saying about knowing what to do with some chewing gum, a toothpick and dental <laughs> floss. Um, I mean, my, my entire first experience um, writing for a film, I had to lean very heavily into that background because, you know, I was just, you know, fortunately I had a chamber ensemble. So I did have a connection with some classical players, you know, so that's how, how we made it happen. Um, I used, you know, I wasn't using any of the traditional film industry stuff, I used um, an analog friendly studio. Um, mm. You know, <laughs> I, I worked with people I worked with in my experimental chamber ensemble and the DIY ethos that I grew up with, you know, finding my voice in the punk rock and hardcore scene is what allowed me to in four and a half weeks do this thing that I'd never done before, figure out, you know, and it was punk rock cause I used GarageBand for those demos. So I was definitely punk rock, but fortunately <laughs> Dee and I had a rapport, she had, we had that foundation of trust and she knew what I was capable of. So while the tools I had were a bit blunt, she got the idea and she mm. believed in me and trusted. And so, you know, from there I've like expanded and, and evolved my, my setup and my, my work, but certainly leaned on that. I mean, you know? Yeah. 
yeah totally when what's what's the ideal for you when it comes to when you're brought in on a project because with Shirley you know with you saying that you the film had been shot and you 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 kind of saw it and reacted to it and and how you connected to it and those conversations as well you know that you, that you had about it but do you has that been different through every project in terms of you know I've spoken to some composers who they they just want to read the script and they want to work from that or you know what's what's the do you have a preference or how do you prefer to work what's the optimum um, you know, I've 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 essentially given up on the idea of having a specific preference because every yeah. project is different, every director is different, and di directors you've worked with even can be different for another film because it's a different vibration, the work is different, different circumstances, different crew. So mm -hmm. I know that initially I had this instinct around wanting things a certain way, just because I was used to it the first time. But, you know, my creative process as a, as a composer will always be the same. How the projects come to me are just how they come. And I'm fine with that organic flow. Um, what I love about collaborating with people across disciplines is you have to take the time to listen and to learn how these other people function, how they create, how they communicate, how they, how they listen, how they hear. So I don't really want to try to, you know, create um, and anticipate certain behavior or have expectations that's going to block me from being able to make the, to, 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 to create that bond with the person, yeah. I'm, person I'm collaborating with. So I've worked in different ways, written straight to film, which is nice to do. I've also created themes, you know, just stepped away from picture created themes, thought about stuff. I do a, a great, a good amount of musing and research um, just so that I could have the project really get in me, you know, yeah. so that I can then create from a space of understanding the work or the, the mindset of a, a character or the spirit of that time, just, you know, as a, as a creative um, enhancer. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm not, you know, my creative process will always be the same, how I come to the process of writing a piece and composing, but I, I really, for me, I have found it is better not to, to, to project or throw out presumptions and have expectations about how, you know, yeah. the director or my collaborators are going to engage. I want I, them to accept me as I am. I need to be able to accept. Them. Yeah. And, and I, I imagine as well, you know, as you say, every project as well kind of warrants a different set of emotions and a different reaction. And those performances as well are, are something, are, are those something that, that they influence you in, in a way? I mean, I think, you know, Elizabeth's performance in this film, for example, is just is extraordinary. Um, I mean, God, what a character. I mean, I can't imagine where she started in terms of how she brought her to life, but Oh my God, the, the performance is, is brilliant. Um, does that influence you? Definitely. Um, I take every aspect of the work because that to me is what collaboration is. It's like a dance. Um, so mm. I can be moved by, you know, it's like I'm, I'm consuming the work first. Pardon me. So I'm so sorry. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> I'm, I'm consuming the work first. So that means that, you know, I'm looking at the work, the cinematography, it has some, some effect on my psyche, the mm -hmm. story, the screenplay, you know, the actors, their performances, the strength of it, how, if I'm, if I'm able to just completely lose myself in the work, um, the atmospheric sound, the ambient sound, like the intonation of their voices, all of these things are a factor when I am composing and creating because essentially I am contributing my part of the piece, you know, and, and yeah. they all have to work together and flow. So, yeah. So those things could inform how I'm going to approach the cue. Uh, Jen from Peckham wants to uh, know what kind of film soundtrack composers have been an influence on you, if any. 
Um, <clears throat> well, I always point at uh, my like my earliest memory of music as it deals with a film. And though the, the music was composed before the film, it's mm -hmm. Prokofiev's Peter and the Wolf. So as a child, that was a really big part wow. of my childhood. And just, so it's like, you know, we might not even realize that we have this experience with Legotis, you know, knowing the themes of the wolf, knowing the theme of, you know, Peter and Sasha. And, you know, so that's a super early memory. Um, in terms of when I started composing, there are certainly people whose work definitely touched me from Yuchi Sakamoto to um, uh, Pr um, Big New Presner. Um, you know, then there are folks that I've come to know their work more recently and really enjoy it. Oh, and also, yeah, I mean, when Johnny Greenwood stepped into that world, I mean, I think he's produced some pretty amazing scores. Um, Le Philip Glass, um, mm -hmm. some folks that I've come to know and respect, Daniel Pemberton, you know. Mm -hmm. um, there's, uh, and then there, I feel like it's so exciting in terms of showing a range Mm. of not only sounds and approaches, but, you know, previous dispositions. I mean, whether it's like Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross and, you know, people who are performing and recording artists like Johnny Greenwood too, and um, Emile Mosieri too, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, there's so much going on. Mika, Mika. Um, oh yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, there's, I, I don't know. It just, it, it seems from what I remember coming up what the world of film scoring was like, it feels a lot more vibrant and dynamic and diverse now. And that's not um, a judgment call on the work. It's just, you know, maybe with the, uh, with technology for the same reasons that I can function in this space in a way that I may not have been able to 20 years ago, yeah. just off the air, like, labor intensity and scope of work that it required. I remember talking to Nico Muley and he was telling me about when he used to assist with Philip Glass and he was talking about all the VHSs, like te tapes or, yeah, when I used to, when I, I used to had a conversation with Vernon Reed as well, cause he's done some of this. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm so glad that I can like bust out the digital files and the logic because I, you know, or even like, I remember watching watching the Quincy Jones documentary and seeing him there literally with physical film. And I was just like, <laughs> you know I mean? like it was such a labor of a love and intensity before. I mean, you know, it's like, yeah. oh man, oh man. And, it, and I, I'm able to see how far I've come. Like I found some charts today of me writing out charts and I'm like, you know, I'm grateful that I've been able to expand my skill to this digital world, work in a digital audio, you know, station work with copywriting software and things of that nature so that I could have this more expansive, artistic, expressive practice. I think it's so exciting. I think that, yeah, the, the composing world is, is, it feels like this big sexy world now. It's kind of, it's just got so much going on in it. I think it's amazing. And when you look at the diversity of work that you've been involved in and how, how different each project is, um, you know, I mentioned the, the the assistant, and and that's a very particular film, and and required a very particular kind of delicate kind of soundscape to it, really, so that it didn't interfere with this this you know this environment around this girl, this woman. But um, but it's so exciting to see and and hear where where you go with your with your film composing as as well. Um. And I know that you're working, you've worked again with Dee on, on the next film and, and, and hopefully that's a, you know, that's an, a thing that I think you find quite a lot with filmmakers and composers is you, you build relationships and those relationships go on film after film after film after film. And it's so exciting to see where that collaboration goes. Yeah, I mean, her, the, 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 the second film that I did with Dee um, premiered at Sundance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was a completely different, um, situation than the first one, you know, it was financed out the gate, which is great. Um, those were some of the largest arrangements that I've done for film so far. So that was exciting. Yeah. Um, and 
You know, in terms of the assistant, what you mentioned, you know, what I loved about working with Kitty is that she's in her 20s and she's so, she has such strong vision. And I just found her very brave. She understood the tonality she wanted to present for this film. And mm. she just had her focus and she just walked a straight line. Um, it was very important that music didn't overpower that work. Mm. And yeah. um, she she knew it. And, you know, even things that were making me nervous, like, you know, have my largest, longest cue go over the credits. <clears throat> she knew people were gonna have to sit with this work and that that was quite like that was the perfect moment to have the most pronounced piece yeah. you know the rest of the work had been in so just having those brilliant instincts and you know the focus and the courage to manifest it you know mm -hmm. these are the things that you live for in collaboration to work with these type of artists and um, just before we finish as well with, with something like Shirley just going back back to that where there's a where there's a film that is a, an adaptation of a novel, will you go back and read the novel beforehand if you haven't already to to get to the you know the kind of uh, the the core of of the, the story I guess in a way. So because this novel was a fictional representation of her life, mm. what I really did was I was just researching her. Yeah. Um, and you know there's something about her when you look at her um, in history, she was such an enigma and just, you know, these stories about these people who are avant-garde or they seem out of the space and time that they existed in. Um, so a lot was just to be gleaned from her life story, understanding that she was essentially the main breadwinner in the house, yet she functioned as this faculty wife to her philandering husband at Bennington, this all women's university in New England and just like all of that, the culture, the class. Um, I also heard that she and Stanley were mentors to Ralph Ellison who wrote The Invisible Man. So I was just like getting into like the nooks and crannies, crannies of their everyday life together. And, um, you know, just this kind of like tortured muse, spouse, you know, strange relationship yeah, yeah, that they yeah. had, you know, cause it's all there and thinking about that time um, so th that's the stuff that I was really researching at the time, because that's what helped me to really understand the dynamic between she and Stanley before, you know, you know like to, to really bring it home for the film, yeah. you know, and it's, it, nothing was in your face so obvious. And it was so important to get into the psychology of these characters in order for the score to work, I think. Yeah, I'm so excited to hear what's next. Um, can you tell us? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I have um, a habit of kind of like hunkering down and just like mm. going in my hidey hole and just trying to create like, possible. And then, you know, like a kind of catch and release, like catch all the inspiration and you know, whip stuff up and then just release it. So I'm imagining that 2022 will be a year of lots of releases, maybe starting towards the end of 2021. Um, I'm working on a range of projects um, from right. my next recording release um, to um, some dramatic works that I'm setting to music. Um, I have a residency with Opera America. I'll be working on an original opera that I had conceived wow. of in, a long time ago, quite some time ago, when there weren't really any opportunities for me to develop the work, and now there is. So I'm super excited about that. I'm just excited to just be writing and recording and just like, you know, kicking 21 in the tuchus because boy, <laughs> yeah. 2020 was a doozy. <laughs> oh, wasn't it just? Um, but we uh, we had some incredible films to to help get us through that as well, and 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 some of those as well featuring your amazing yeah. work. And um, thank you so much for taking the time to come and join us from Brooklyn tonight. It's so wonderful to chat to you. And um, stay safe. And uh, I look forward to getting the chance to chat to you again. You're thank well. you. Stay healthy. Thanks, Tamara Kali. And thank you so much to our guest, Tamara Kali. Thank we you so have much. 
We've got more discussions uh, about the wonderful Shirley in the Cars and Living Room over the next week. Live interviews this Thursday with Elizabeth Moss and then on Tuesday the 19th of January, director Josephine Decker. And you can follow Cars and Cinema on Twitter and Facebook for all the updates. Shirley is available now to stream on Cars and Home Cinema. If you enjoyed the film and this event, please tell your friends. I've been your host tonight, Edith Bowman. Thank you so much for having me. Take care.